This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 39 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, everyone, to another edition. I am so glad that you are here that you have found this podcast. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here on the Homestead Journey. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And folks, it has been another beautiful week here on our homestead. Before we jump into that, I did just want to say thank you so much, everyone. Um, We are right at 20,000 downloads of this podcast and uh, just creeping up on that. And so thank you so much um, for taking time again to listen, to share uh, this podcast with, with others. I really, really do greatly appreciate it. If you haven't already, I really would appreciate it if you jump over to iTunes or your favorite podcasting platform and leave us a review or a thumbs up. Um, Those kinds of things really do help others find the podcast. And so I really would appreciate it if you would do that. Make sure if you haven't already to hit subscribe. Again, we're on uh, Apple, Stitcher, Google, Spotify, Uh, And you can also find us on thehomesteadjourney.net, and you can actually subscribe there as well. And then you will not miss a wonderful episode of the Homestead Journey podcast. I really do want to say thank you for your patience with me last week. Um, The fact that I was a little bit late in putting out the episode, um, I just thank you for your patience uh, and and hanging with me on that. But today, hopefully, God willing, this episode is going to go live as scheduled, as planned. Anyhow, with all of that said, let's r- jump right into this week's Homestead Happenings. So this week, uh, as you, if, if you're following us on Facebook and Instagram, and if you're not, why not? <laughs> uh, I have been trying to keep you up to date with some of the things that we had going on here. And uh, so you may remember seeing a picture of a feed bin that uh, I am in the process of building to hold our hog feed. Um, I have been having a lot of problems with chipmunks this year. And in part, it's my own fault. Uh, I have been keeping my feed just on a pallet stacked in the shed. And so the chipmunks have kind of been been treating it as their own golden corral or old country buffet and uh, kind of been going to town on it. And so um, this week I, I was down to my last few bags of hog feed and so I got them out of the way and I cleaned up. I, I moved all of the feed that had been spilt, which really broke my heart um, because uh, just so much waste there. But I was very hesitant to just feed that back to the pigs because you're not really quite sure if they've left, you know, some um, presence in there, shall we say. And I do want to be careful that I am not passing on any kind of diseases to my animals. Um, But I I cleaned it out, and then on top of a pallet, uh, I started building a feed bin using some scrap tin that we had left over, some two-by-fours that I had left over from when I built the mobile chicken coop. And so up to this point, with the exception of a few screws, and uh, I went and bought some expanding foam to try to plug some of the holes where I felt like they might be able to get in. Right now I have no money in that feed bin. It's put together with, it's a, it's a homestead hack job, but I don't think it looks too bad, but it's just bits and bobs that we had laying around here on the homestead. And so that was a big, uh, a big project that I did this week. This week we also, my wife and son went and picked blueberries. And so we were kind of feeling a little blue this week here on the homestead. Uh, I did a batch of blueberry jam. 
Now, blueberry jam, quite honestly, is not my favorite jam. I love the flavor of blueberry jam, but the texture, it's just a little bit gritty just because of the nature of blueberries and then because of the skins of the blueberries being in there. Um, it's, it's not my favorite, but I still made a batch of blueberry jam. My wife and son made a blueberry pie using some of the lard from our American guinea hogs, which just makes an exceptional crust. So we enjoyed that today. Very, very yummy. And then uh, I bought a dehydrator, an Excalibur dehydrator. And so I took a crack at dehydrating blueberries. And quite frankly, it didn't go very well. And in part, it's because... I misread the instructions on how to, to pre-treat the blueberries uh, to, to kind of get the skins to crack a little bit so that they will dehydrate better. And so I now know what I did wrong. And so we have a few blueberries left and I'm going to take another crack at that. But that was the maiden voyage of our Excalibur dehydrator. And uh, we actually have some vegetables coming on out of the uh, garden that I'm going to talk about here in a little bit. I'm going to be doing a run hopefully this week of them in the dehydrator as well. So speaking of the garden, let's talk about what we've got going on over there. Uh, the garden is looking really, really great. And I do feel like the deer fence that I told you about last week that we put up uh, is working well without the electricity. So I think I'm going to take that um, uh, solar p powered uh, a fence charger back to tractor supply and get my money back uh, because I think that that kind of 3D thing is working uh, with regards to keeping the deer out. This week I harvested my first zucchini and I was so excited about it. I posted it on Instagram. I shared it on a bunch of Facebook groups. I shared it on Reddit and I, I kind of entitled it. I know it's just zucchini, but Zucchini has been my nemesis over the last couple of years, and I'm embarrassed to share that, but now I feel like a real gardener because I'm growing zucchini. Well, the funny thing was, I was overwhelmed by the number of people who replied and said, yeah, I've been struggling to grow zucchini too. And so then I didn't feel quite so bad. <laughs> now, is that that misery loves company? I, I don't know. But zucchini is one of those things that, you know, you kind of, well, you, you kind of feel like it's dummy proof. And then when it doesn't grow right and you're having problems with pests and whatnot, um, you kind of feel like a failure. Like, okay, what kind of a gardener am I? And, and what kind of, uh, you know, how in the world can I help other people on their homestead journey when I can't even grow zucchini? But then when I heard that feedback from other people that they have been struggling with growing zucchini, in fact, a friend of mine from work has been telling me, he lives just down over the hill from me, he's been struggling to grow zucchini the last couple of years, and it just seems like there's something in the air. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the squash borers, or if it's the cucumber beetles, or if it's just some kind of viruses that are taking out the zucchini. Um, I need to do a little bit more research into it, but it does seem like I'm getting at least some Although after I did post those pictures, a couple of my summer squash plants just just died. Just out of nowhere, they were they were looking great one day and the next day they were just dead. So I don't know, I got to do a little research into that and figure out what's going on, but at least I got some zucchini. Uh I was able to harvest my first patty pan squash uh today. I'm very excited about that. I've never grown them, never eaten them that I know of unless I did it at some restaurant. So excited about that. Harvested my first yellow squash today. And our beans are coming on great. Even though we had some deer damage, the beans are still looking awesome. And so tomorrow starts pressure canning season here on the homestead. It always seems like every year beans is what kicks off our pressure canning. I'm also planning on doing some dilly beans. Uh, really enjoy those, and so we'll be doing a batch of, of dilly beans. But uh, tomorrow, canning season, I don't want to say starts in earnest because, I don't know, it, it's funny to me. Just It feels like strawberry jam is usually kicks is what kicks off canning season to begin with. It's, it's my usually the first thing that I can, although this year I did can lilac jelly, so that may be the beginning of my canning season from now on. Um, but when it comes to pressure canning, it's always beans that are the first things to come in, and we'll start canning those tomorrow. 
my sweet potatoes this week just seemed to take off in the Ruth Stout Garden. I had shared with you a couple of weeks ago that they weren't looking great. And there still are a lot of patches where they're, they they didn't take. But uh, they are looking very good where they did take. And um, somebody reached out to me this week with some pointers and some, you know, some places where I might want to consider buying my sweet potato slips from in the future. So I'm going to be looking into that. So thank you so much for that feedback. I really, really do appreciate that. The tomatoes are looking awesome. Just very, very lush. Uh, they didn't start out looking so hot. Um, I wasn't quite sure if we were going to get any tomatoes this year, but they are really taking off and uh, it looks really, really good for a great tomato harvest. I also this week started some cucumbers. Um, it, it's This is the first time I've ever started cucumbers this late. Um, and I'm thinking it was this week I started them. Maybe I started them last week. Hmm. I may have told you about that last week, but they've popped up this week. They're looking really good. But I, I believe I had shared with you last week that I had started some brassicas and they were looking really good. And then stupid old me forgot to water them. And so I lost all, well, I lost a full tray of brassicas and then about a third of the second tray. And so I started them all over again. I started kale and Brussels sprouts and broccoli and I can't remember what all um, this week. So hopefully it's not too late. Um, but you know what? That's just, a, it's one of those things. I, I had them in a location. It was kind of out of sight, out of mind. And so I learned or relearned or maybe just was reminded. <laughs> I guess if I would have learned the lesson a long time ago, I wouldn't have let them dry out. But uh, anyhow, Water is very important. <laughs> and so I relearned, I was reminded of that again this week. And so um, got my brassicas restarted for a fall crop. Anyhow, that's what's been going on here on the homestead. I hope your gardens are doing well and that you are starting to achieve that abundant harvest. It's one of those things that as I look on Facebook on the homesteading groups, and there's so many homesteaders down in you know North Carolina or Alabama, down, down south Mississippi, where their growing season starts so much earlier than ours does. Uh, I always feel... Um, inadequate. I always feel a little bit behind because a lot of you are way beyond where I'm at now. Uh, and if you are great, I hope things are going well for you. And if you are in, you know, the northern part of the United States and you're dealing with the growing conditions that I'm dealing with, well, keep your chin up. Uh, we're going to achieve a harvest. It may just be a little later than where everybody else is, is at. All right, let's jump on over to this week's charting the course. I am entitling this week's episode, You Can Can, A Beginner's Guide to Home Canning. You know, right now there are a lot of people who are showing interests in learning to can, and it kind of goes hand in glove. You've got a lot of people that have started gardens this year for the first time and are raising animals for meat for the first time. And now we've got to do something with that harvest. And I think it's it's awesome. A lot of people very interested in learning to can, but there, there are also a lot of people who are very scared of canning as well. Uh, in fact, I know a number of people, I have some friends who actually have pressure canners that they have had sitting in closets for years because they're too afraid to try it. And so if you're one of those kinds of people, either you're brand new to it, you're wanting to jump in, you're not really quite sure where to start, or you're maybe somebody who's been kind of sitting on the edge, wanting to take that leap, but a little scared. Well, my goal is to help you get started. Now, as I've said many times on this podcast, I am not an expert in many things. But if there's an area where I feel some level of expertise, and I hope that doesn't come across braggadociously, but if there's an area where I feel like I have some level of expertise or at least experience, it's in the area of canning. I have been doing this directly myself for 14 years, uh, and I grew up around this. My mom and dad canned, my grandparents canned, I've got aunts and uncles that canned, so this is something that is certainly not a foreign concept to me. 
Now, I don't have any kind of certifications in this area. My goal eventually is to achieve the Master Food Preser, I think it's called Master Food Preserver. It's a certification that you can get through Cornell University, through the Cornell Cooperative Extension, but it's that's a certification that is available through many uh, extension offices throughout uh, the United States. Um, but my goal is to achieve that certification. In fact, I had looked into taking the classes this year, but obviously COVID uh, had a few other ideas for us. But uh, what that is, is it simply means that you go through a, a class where they talk about proper food preservation techniques and food handling techniques. Uh, they look at canning, freezing, dehydrating, fermenting, uh, and then you take a test basically and then you achieve this certification after you do some practical um, teaching uh, and so my goal someday is to get that but you know in in the spirit of full disclosure i don't have that my my expertise if if you want to call it that or my experience has simply come via doing it and i've canned literally thousands of jars of food safely uh, over the last 14 years so having said that, let's kind of jump right into this. There are two methods of canning that are generally considered safe for home food preservation. Now, there certainly are other methods out there, um, but there is some debate over whether or not those methods are safe. I don't practice those methods, uh, and so I'm not going to talk about them. I'm not going to get into the debate about whether or not they are safe or they are not safe. I don't practice them, um, and so we're just simply not going to talk about them. If, if you're interested in them, you know, do some research, and if you choose to go that route, I would recommend that you investigate carefully so you understand the risks, but today we are going to be talking about water bath canning and pressure canning. Now, in some ways, they are very similar. You put food into jars. You apply lids to those jars. The jars and the lids and the bands, if you're using them, uh, are heated. A vacuum is created. The jars are sealed. The food is preserved. Now, just as they are similar, they are also very different. Water bath canning, as the name implies, uses hot water, boiling water, to heat the jars to heat the food, and because the max temp uh, or the temperature of boiling water is 212 degrees Fahrenheit, that really is the max temperature that you're going to achieve with hot water bath canning. Now, why do I bring that up? Well, I will explain in a minute why temperature is important. But with, with hot water bath canning, there is no special equipment required. You probably can hot water bath can with things that you currently have in your kitchen. As long as you have jars and lids and bands, you can hot water bath can in a stock pot as long as it's deep enough so that the jars are covered by at least two inches of water. So there's no special equipment required to hot water bath can other than the jars, the lids, and the bands. Now you can buy one piece lids but most people will use jars or lids and bands. The second method, as I said, is pressure canning. And pressure canning, it uses pressure. I mean, this is, I, I, you know, to a certain extent, I feel like, well, anyhow, it uses pressure. <laughs> but because it uses pressure, it can actually achieve a maximum, a maximum temperature of 240 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, obviously, this is going to require a special piece of equipment that we call a pressure canner. Now, keep in mind that a pressure canner and a pressure cooker are two different things. You can use a pressure canner as a pressure cooker, but you cannot use a pressure cooker as a pressure canner. The difference between the two simply comes down to how the unit is calibrated. A pressure cooker is not going to be precisely calibrated to achieve a certain PSI, 
Uh, generally speaking, it doesn't have a gauge on it, so you don't even know what the PSI is. Whereas a pressure canner is going to have a gauge, and many times that it will have a gauge or a weighted gauge um, that will help it achieve a particular pressure so that you can achieve a particular uh, temperature. Many people in today's day and age are familiar with electric pressure cookers, like the Instant Pots. Those, again, are not designed as canners. Now, I do believe that there are some electric pressure canners on the market. I'm not familiar with those, so I can't speak to those. But the Instant Pots, the electric pressure cookers, generally speaking, are not going to work as a pressure canner. Now, you can cook meats and so on and so forth, the things, uh, chicken, that you would cook in a pressure cooker. You could do that in a pressure canner. But a pressure canner is also going to have the, the weights and the gauges that are going to help you understand and know what pressure your canner is at because it's important that you maintain that pressure throughout the duration of the canning process to ensure food safety. So, hot water bath uses hot water, pressure can, pressure canner uses pressure in order to achieve the same results of heating the jars and the food to create the vacuum to seal the jars and preserve the food for long-term storage. So, these two methods also have two very different applications. A hot water bath canner is good for high acid foods. So things like tomatoes, things like salsas, things like jellies and jams. It's good for those kinds of food. You see, boiling water, it will kill most molds, yeasts, and bacteria that could cause food to spoil. And the acid in the food so maybe vinegar and the pickles or the acid from the tomatoes, that's going to keep botulism toxin from growing. We'll talk a little bit more about botulism toxin here in a little bit. A pressure canner, it is good for low acid fruits and vegetables as well as meats. Remember back when I talked about the temperatures of a hot water bath canner reaching 212 degrees, versus a pressure canner, which can reach 240 degrees. Well, 240 degrees is the minimum temperature at which botulism spores are killed. So that means that it doesn't matter how long you hot water bath something, it's never going to achieve the temperature necessary to kill botulism spores without the acid that comes along from the vinegar from the pickles or the vinegar you know the acid from the tomatoes or or even the the acid from the fruit the botulism spores will never ever be killed it requires that pressure which elevates the temperature to 240 degrees at which the botulism spores can then be killed so what is botulism? Well, if you Google botulism, there's a lot of information that's out there, but I ran across a really great website. I'll link to it in the show notes. It's called healthlinkbc.ca. And they have a really great, it, it's because some of the, the websites you run across, they just, they get way down into the weeds of all of the science. All right. Um, this really is very easy to understand, so even I could understand it. <laughs> now, maybe you're somebody who can jump into all of the science of stuff, and so maybe the other sites are better for you, um, but this one here just breaks it down very easy to understand so that even, even I can get it. <laughs> so, botulism, it's a serious, and I'm basically reading this off of their website, botulism is a serious form of food poisoning that can cause death. The poison is produced produced by Clostridium botulinum. I'm sorry, I don't have a degree, I don't speak Latin. <laughs> a bacterium that is commonly found in soil on raw fruits and vegetables, on meat and fish, and on many other foods and surfaces. 
Botulism spores are tough and cannot be killed with boiling water or heat without including canning pressures. Botulism bacteria, the bacteria that grow out of germinated spores, can multiply quickly in a moist, oxygen-free environment and create a very powerful poison. One teaspoonful is enough to kill 100,000 people. Now, when you think about that, a moist, oxygen-free environment is where botulism bacteria can germinate very quickly or grow very quickly, multiply quickly. That is the condition that we are creating when we can food. And so, improper home canning creates the perfect environment to grow botulism bacteria. And because food contaminated by botulism may look and smell normal, you cannot tell by looking at the food whether or not it is poisoned by botulism bacteria. So, I don't say that to scare you, because again, if you follow proper canning procedures, you're going to be fine. If you heat the food, in the case of low acid fruits, vegetables, and meats, if you heat it to a temperature of at least 240 degrees that you achieve with a pressure canner, you're going to be great. You're going to be okay. But unfortunately, and I don't know why, but there are some people who insist on hot water bath canning everything. Everything. Now, I've kind of boiled it down to a few ideas that I, I've Maybe these are the reasons why people want to hot water bath can everything. They're scared of pressure canners. There are some people that act like there's some kind of government conspiracy with regards to pressure canning recommendations that somehow the government is trying to steal our freedoms on how we want to preserve our food. (laughs) Some people will simply say, well, grandma did it. She hot water bath canned everything and she lived to be a hundred years old. Some people will also say, well, as long as the jar seals, it's fine. Why does it matter? And then finally, some people will say, well, pressure canners cost too much. I don't want another piece of high priced, high fluting equipment in my kitchen that I don't need. But let's just deal with these items one by one. First of all, pressure canners are not dangerous as long as you follow common sense things. Now, I know many people have seen pictures of pressure canners that have exploded. You know, the lid is in the ceiling. There's uh, tomato sauce all over the ceiling. You know, people have seen those pictures and, and that makes them fearful. But if you keep your pressure canner in good working order, you make sure that the pressure relief valve is unclogged, your I promise you, your pressure canner is not going to explode. Pressure canners explode when things get clogged and plugged up. So as long as you are practicing, you know, good common sense, uh, you know, caretaking of your equipment, you're going to be fine. And just don't let your pressure canner boil dry. Make sure you have the proper amount of water in it. Number two, there is no government conspiracy. (laughs) These canning recommendations are simply based in science. There are a number of organizations out there that make these recommendations, but a couple of the better known ones is the National Home for Food Preservation, which is actually operated by the University of Georgia. There is also the Ball Blue Book of Canning, which many refer to it as the Bible of Canning. That's not government propaganda. It's not printed by the government. (laughs) It's printed by Ball. And they have a vested interest in making sure that we don't kill ourselves. Because if we kill ourselves, then we they don't have repeat customers. (laughs) Now, I'm not knocking grandma. Certainly, grandma may have hot water bath canned everything and live to 101. But sometimes grandma lived to 101 in spite of herself. Right? There are a lot of things that grandma may have done. And again, I'm not knocking grandma. But there are a lot of things that grandma may have done that we, knowing what we know now, would say that probably wasn't wise. She did the best she could. But we know things today from a scientific perspective. Again, going back to science, 
that botulism is real. It multiplies in those kinds of environments. It cannot be killed by hot water bath canning. And so we know a little bit more than grandma does, and maybe we need to use our noggins. Now, just because a jar seals doesn't mean it's fine. In fact, as, as I explained earlier, the environment that is created, that environment is where botulism thrives. It's where it grows best. And unlike molds and yeasts and bacterias, you cannot taste or smell botulism. And so that makes it very dangerous. And finally, the argument about pressure cannings cost too much. Yes, pressure canners can cost a lot of money. If you buy an All-American and you go with the biggest one they have, it could set you back almost 500 bucks. But it doesn't have to. A 23-quart Presto canner, you can buy it for less than 90 bucks on RuralKing.com and many other places. I just happened to find it on RuralKing.com. And many times you can find them even cheaper than that on Craigslist or Facebook Marketplace. Although right now, quite frankly, there is, it's very difficult to find canners just like it's difficult to find freezers. And then people are always finding all Americans, which is kind of the Cadillac, shall we say, of canners in, in many people's eyes. People are finding them all the time at garage sales and estate sales and flea markets and thrift stores for cheap. You just have to keep your eye out for them. So maybe you start with a 23 quart Presto. You want to get a feel for, do I like canning? Is this something I want to dedicate more time, more money, more energy, all of those kinds of things too. And then you keep an eye out at the thrift stores, the flea markets, the estate sales, Craigslist, Facebook, and see if you can score one for a, a good deal. I saw this week somebody found an All-American, I think it was a 921, it was an older model, but the beautiful thing about the All-Americans is they're built like tanks. They're going to they're gonna outlive us. And they found one at an, an estate sale or a, a thrift store for like five bucks. Now, I was lucky enough to find a 930 at a flea market for 70 bucks. And I bought my 921 on Facebook Marketplace for 100 bucks, And I thought I got a great deal on both of them. Mine definitely cost me more than 5 bucks, But, but again, it was, it, was a, it was a pretty darn good deal. But at the end of the day, can you really put a price tag on having the right tool for the job and the peace of mind that you know that your food's not going to kill anybody? Now, you may be sitting there saying, but Brian, I thought you were going to try to encourage me to take that leap of faith and to get into this. And so far, it just seems to be a lot of negativity. <laughs> All right, we're getting there. You see, canning is very, very, very safe if you follow a few common sense steps. So number one, use the right method for the food you are preserving. Hot water bath can the high acid fruits and vegetables and pressure can the low acid fruits, vegetables, and meats. Use the right method for the food you are preserving. When you are prepping the food, follow basic cleanliness procedures. Use clean utensils. Clean and sanitize your workstations. Don't cut raw chicken on your cutting board and then cut up your veggies for the salsa you're going to can. Don't let your cats crawl over your countertops, especially when you're canning. In my opinion, you shouldn't let them crawl all over your countertops even when you're not canning, but you do you and I'll do me. <laughs> Be wary of recipes you find on the internet, unless they're coming from a reputable source like Ball's website or the National Center for Home Food Preservation or someplace like that. At the end of the day, this is very scientific. And I don't, I don't say that to scare you. I simply say that is the ratios and so forth that they use to calculate, uh, they use those ratios to calculate how long things should be pressure canned. So if you start messing with those ratios or you just, you know, people are kind of throwing whatever they want into this recipe, then you may not can it long enough to make sure that everything is killed like all the botulism is killed. So especially when you're starting out and you're brand new to this, make sure the recipes you are, are using come from 
legit places, not some Facebook group, not even grandma's recipes. Um, I, 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 and and I, again, I'm not banging on grandma here, but you want to make sure that you understand the basics so that you can look at a recipe and you can say, ah, you know what? I don't think that recipe, and, and sometimes you can't tell, all right? But there are sometimes there are just obvious things that jump out at you when you look at something and maybe they're telling you to, to hot water bath can something um, that you know is a low acid fruit, vegetable, or meat. Say, okay, that's not a good idea. So you, as, you, as you understand the rules of canning, you can start looking at some of those recipes and then you can kind of make a decision, a judgment as far as whether or not you want to risk things. But you want to start by using recipes that are tried and true. And so there's the Ball Blue Book of Canning. There's a number of ball canning books. In fact, I will link to one, the one that I use in the in the show notes. Um, it's a great canning book. It's got a lot of, of, of great information in it. But you follow those recipes to a T, including processing times, pressures, and elevation considerations, and you're going to be okay. And as you do that, you start learning the rules, so to speak, of canning. You start getting comfortable with that. And then if you want to play around with things and kind of risk it for a biscuit, that's up to you. <laughs> but at least you know, you know the rules. You want to make sure that your stove is very stable. Uh, if you opt to can on a camp stove, and there are a lot of people that will do that to get the heat out of the house, ensure that it is level and stable. The last thing you want to do is have somebody come walking by and knock over the pressure canner. Yeah, then things could go boom, right? So make sure your stove is very stable. Keep an eye on your kids, folks. Please keep an eye on your kids. When you're canning, it's not a time for them to be uh, horsing around in the kitchen. Uh, it, it's, you know, just please keep an eye on them. You don't want to have them pull your hot water bath uh, canner over onto them because they wanted to see what was in it. So keep an eye on your kids. Don't try to reuse lids. There are a lot of people that try to do that, and some people have success doing it, but lids really are not designed, unless you're using Tatlers, which is a, a special lid that is designed to be reused, but the general run-of-the-mill lids, generally speaking, are not designed to be reused. And it's not that you reusing them is going to cause a situation where you're going to poison your family because of botulism. By and large, what's going to happen is things aren't going to seal right and you're going to waste food. And I, I, I hate to see you do that over a 12 cent lid. Just buy a brand new lid. I mean, if the apocalypse happens and, and, and push comes to shove, you got to do what you got to do. But by and large, do not reuse lids. And the same thing goes for jars. Sometimes I see people use old mayonnaise jars and, and whatever jars they can find. But a lot of those jars are not designed either to handle the pressure or to handle the pressure multiple times. So they, they, they're, they're designed for single use. And yes, I know some people have successfully used mayonnaise jars and, and whatever other kinds of jars. But if you have a, a jar break, you've lost that food. And for what? Uh, to me, use mason jars, canning jars, uh, but things that are specifically designed to, to handle the heats, the pressures, and the multiple times that you're going to use them. And sometimes they fail. Sometimes they fail. It, it happens. But um, you're going to have less, I think, less likelihood if you use canning jars than you would if you're using mayonnaise jars and so forth. And finally... When in doubt, throw it out. If it looks or smells funny, don't eat it. Sometimes things simply don't seal right. A piece of food gets stuck on the lid or there's an imperfection on the rim um, and things just don't seal right. And that's okay. Um, you can reprocess uh, if you catch it soon enough. There's things that you can do. But if you don't catch it, you put it in your pantry and now all of a sudden the, the, the lid starts bulging or you open it up and it just doesn't smell right, uh, don't eat it. When in doubt, throw it out. We have had jars that have sealed perfectly 
and then they were in the pantry and they got bumped. They became unsealed. I didn't realize it. And trust me, folks, nothing stinks quite as bad as a jar of pressure canned chicken that has come unsealed but has been sitting in a pantry. That is a nasty, nasty smell. And then trying to diagnose and find that smell sometimes can be a bit challenging. But at the end of the day, when in doubt, throw it out. There's no sense of risking your health, the health of your loved ones, over canned goods. And that really holds true from canned goods you buy at the store, too. But I'm not going to go there. But folks, if you if you follow these, I mean, to me, these are very simple, common steps things. Use the right method for the food you're preserving. Follow basic cleanliness procedures. Use tried and true recipes and follow those recipes to a T. Make sure your stove is stable. Keep an eye on your kids. Don't reuse jars and non-canning, I'm sorry, non-canning jars and lids. And when in doubt, throw it out. If you follow those basic steps, you are going to be fine. You are going to enjoy some great food from your homestead. Now, if you're still worried about canning, I would suggest you do this. Check with your local community college because sometimes local community colleges will have courses on food preservation. Or check with your local extension agent. Uh, here in New York State, we have Cornell Cooperative Extension. Every um, state has something a little bit different. But see if you can find a local class on canning, on food preservation. See if you can find a mentor locally to help walk you through canning the first time. Or look for an online course that you can take that will show you the basics. Now, keep in mind, I would recommend it come from a reputable source. Um, but find somebody that you trust that can show you the basics. A couple of weeks ago on our Facebook page, I actually shared a link to a class that the University of Pennsylvania was holding with regards to canning. I don't remember exactly what the dates were on that, but you might want to jump on over to our Facebook page, scroll down and look and see if you can find that post and see if maybe that's something that might be of interest to you. Home canning is a means of food preservation that can be safely done at home. Yes, it takes some thoughtfulness, but as long as you follow basic food safety steps, you will be able to to fill your pantry with food that tastes great, it looks pretty, and it will result in many satisfying meals during the winter months ahead. You can can. All right, everybody, that is the end of this week's episode. If you have any questions about canning, I, I would be glad to do my best to try to help you along the way and to give you the confidence that you need to, to be able to get this done. So reach out to me, Brian at the homestead journey.net. If you've got any other comments or questions, if you've got some topics that you would love to hear me uh, cover, I'm definitely open to suggestions. As I said at the beginning of the show, if you could, I really would appreciate it if you would jump on over to your favorite podcast uh, platform and leave me a review or a thumbs up and share this with other people. If you haven't already, please subscribe on your favorite podcast player or you can also follow us and subscribe over on our website, thehomesteadjourney.net. Links to our social media accounts are in the show notes. You can find us on Instagram, on Facebook, and also on YouTube. Uh, keep in mind that I put up that video a couple of weeks ago with regards to the water level indicator that we're using. And it's working out great, by the way. Um, that we're using with our pig waterers. So you might want to jump on over to YouTube and check that out. If you haven't already subscribed to our YouTube channel, I'd really appreciate it if you do that. The closer we get to a thousand, the sooner I'll be able to do some live um, kind of on location uh, around the homestead uh, video sharing there on YouTube. And I think we can have a lot of fun with that. Having said all of that, folks, Thank you so much again for tuning in. The music on the show, as always, has been provided by Audionautics.com. So a big thank you to them. And until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.